welcome to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and review show, where this week we're looking at Jeep's new Ford Bronco rival, the V8-powered Wrangler 392. We also have BMW's latest Super GT, the M8 Competition, and the somewhat more down-to-earth Toyota Camry. And in this week's Deep Drive, we review the new Seat Leon. That's all coming up. First, though... It goes without saying that the E-Type Jaguar is one of the most beautiful cars ever made and 2021 marks 60 years since it was revealed at the Geneva Motor Show. Of course, such a milestone couldn't just be celebrated with a press release and a YouTube ad. Instead, Jaguar has revealed a match pair of so-called E-Type 60 collection cars and announced plans to restore six pairs of cars to the same specifications. The green Roadster and grey Coupe models pay tribute to the original motor show cars that took the world's breath away in March of 1961. Collectors will not be able to buy the cars separately, with each pair costing £850,000 in either right or left-hand drive. And while the cars will retain their 265 brake horsepower straight-six engines, a few modern conveniences are to be added, including modern ignition and cooling systems, discrete infotainment and close-ratio five-speed gearboxes. The Toyota Camry has long been a big seller in North America and many other parts of the world. It took a 15-year hiatus here in Europe. Toyota's only Euromarket saloon was the frankly forgettable Avensis, but now the Camry is back. So can it leave more of a lasting impression on this side of the pond? Well, a quick glance at the spec sheet and things are looking good. There's a meaty 2.5-litre petrol motor hooked up to Toyota's interestingly named self-charging hybrid system. 215 brake horsepower and loads of kit on both the two trim levels. A promising start then, but you won't need us to tell you that this new Camry is hardly a looker. There's nothing really wrong with the styling, it just won't be turning any heads. Inside, you're treated to a bit more design flair. The dashboard looks great with wood trim and a well-sized central screen. Unfortunately, like the rest of Toyota's current range, the infotainment does leave a lot to be desired. It's slow to respond, complicated to use, and the guidance system looks a bit last gen. On the plus side, both models on offer are fitted with leather as standard. In fact, the only real differences between the basic design model and the top spec XL are the addition of some safety tech and a set of LED fog lights. However, neither model is exactly cheap, with entry-level cars starting at over £31,000, and that's BMW 3 Series territory. And there lies the Camry's biggest problem. The market for sub-premium saloon cars in Europe has all but dried up. Models from more prestigious marks like BMW and Mercedes are now more affordable thanks to the trend for car leasing and financing. And their higher residuals mean the monthly payments are often similar to those of traditionally less desirable models like the Camry. Also, fewer people are choosing big saloons for their family cars, opting instead for trendy new SUVs. It may seem then that the Toyota has missed the mark with the new Camry. The market simply isn't there, so it'll have to rely heavily on the Prius's proven hybrid system to win sales. And now an Auto Mundial deep drive with the new Seat Leon. The Seat Leon has been around for over two decades. It's based on exactly the same MQB platform as the Volkswagen Golf, Audi A3 and even the Skoda Octavia and has been for some time now. And yet this new model brings with it loads of new features such as a fully digital dashboard, new engines and a plug-in hybrid version for the very first time. 
there are no less than six trims, seven engines and two body styles to choose from, a hatch and an estate. There's even a coupe relay on hot hatch variant. So, providing you don't want your say at family car to come with nine seats, 12 wheels and a coffee machine in the centre console, there's probably a lay-on to suit your needs. Technology has always been a strong Seat selling point, but things have been taken up a notch in this new car. Every model gets two screens and the graphics are crystal clear. We take issue with the temperature control, however, which is now a touch bar below the infotainment display. This is a move too far in the war against buttons. It's fiddly to use in the day and even more exasperating at night, as for some reason the controls don't even light up. Neat ambient lighting does lift the mood though. Even entry level SE trim cars look fairly stylish thanks to the standard fit LED headlights, 16 inch alloy wheels and standard metallic paint, while there's an 8 inch infotainment screen inside with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, plus air conditioning, cruise control and rear parking sensors, plus safety kit like autonomous emergency braking and a lane keeping system. SE Dynamic adds slightly larger wheels, a 10 inch screen, sat nav, digital instruments, all round parking sensors and tinted glass. It's this trim we'd opt for if you want to maximise the bang for your buck. FR cars like ours add tweaked bumpers and lower suspension, along with LED rear lights, triple zone climate control and a wireless smartphone charging tray. FR Sport adds more features like extra ambient lighting, 18 inch alloy wheels and a winter pack with heated seats while Sayet's excellence trim concentrates on luxury with added chrome and a suede interior trim that swap for leather in the excellence luxe model. There's more from our Sayat Leon Deep Drive after the break. Join us again after the break as we check out the new V8 Wrangler and a GT from BMW. Coming up, the BMW M8 and a fast Jeep. But first, part two of our Seat Leon Deep Drive. The Leon has long been famed for its sharp handling, and it's safe to say that this latest version doesn't disappoint. There's just something about it that inspires confidence as a driver. There's just a more direct connection between the car and the road than you'd find in most family hatchbacks, which is a really good thing. The steering is quick and it reacts really nicely to your inputs and the brakes, while sharp, don't feel too grabby. All of this means that you can drive this car nice and smoothly, which not only is a boon for the driver, but for their passengers too. The petrol range starts with a one litre three cylinder engine with 109 brake horsepower followed by a more powerful 1.5 litre four-cylinder model. This car is available with either 128 brake horsepower or 148 brake horsepower, and the latter certainly feels punchy enough for a family hatchback, hitting 62 miles an hour in 8.4 seconds. Sitting at the top of the petrol range is a two litre TSI with 187 brake horsepower. A six-speed manual is standard, but you also get the option of a seven-speed DSG automatic, should that float your boat. Seat isn't ditching diesel just yet, offering a familiar 2-litre TDI with either 113 brake horsepower or 148 brake horsepower. The former replaces the 1.6-litre diesel in the outgoing model and is aimed primarily at delivering big fuel economy. The higher power version should offer punchy and smooth acceleration, although we've not had a chance to try it just yet. The Leon that we have here, however, is the new e-hybrid plug-in model which is centred around the Volkswagen Group's 1.4 litre petrol engine mated to an electric motor and a 13 kilowatt hour battery pack. The performance numbers are impressive. It does 0-62 miles an hour in seven and a half seconds, which feels quick, even if it's slightly blunted by this car's heavy curb weight. But like all Leons, it's punchy and refined, and the hybrid system does a pretty good job of mixing petrol and electric power, even if it doesn't do it quite as effectively as a Mercedes A250e. Overall though, 
it's just a really easy car to live with. This plug-in hybrid model will be of particular interest to company car drivers. It will do up to 40 miles on electric power, or perhaps close to 30 miles in normal driving, but more importantly it commands a benefit in kind tax rating of just 6%. That's up there with the most efficient models on the market. Private buyers shouldn't dismiss it either as it's one of the most affordable plug-in hybrids currently on sale. The equivalent petrol engines, despite mild electric assistance, emit far more CO2 and will therefore be much more expensive to tax. Bear in mind, however, that to make the biggest savings and achieve that lofty 230 mile per gallon fuel economy figure, you'll need to be plugging in the car to charge on a regular basis. If you fancy something a little more conventional, and plenty of buyers still will, then the excellent petrol engines are also pleasingly efficient. Depending on which one you go for, and how you drive of course, you can realistically expect between 40 and 50 miles per gallon in normal driving. The diesel should manage nearer to 60 miles per gallon, music to high mileage drivers ears. The Leon has spent most of its life in the shadow of the Volkswagen Golf, but this time around, it feels like a genuine equal. It comes with loads of tech and plenty of kit. It's good to drive and no matter which one you go for, it should be cheap to run too. The Leon finally feels like a car people will actively want, rather than one they'll just simply accept because it's less expensive than the Golf on which it's based. Next week on Deep Drive, the BMW Z4, is it still the premium roadster to go for? Over the years, BMW's M division has given us countless performance legends. From the original M3 to the M1 Supercar and M5 Super Saloons, we're struggling to think of a bad car from BMW's Performance Skunk Works. And now, there is this, the flagship M8 competition. It's just as over the top as we were hoping, with the numbers speaking for themselves. 616 brake horsepower, 189 miles per hour top speed, and a 0 to 62 time of just 3.2 seconds. That is supercar performance in a big luxury coupe. In fact, BMW describes this as the M division's first foray into luxury motoring, which goes some way to justifying the mammoth £123,000 starting price. But that sort of price puts it right up against some pretty serious competition, a fact that BMW seems to be acutely aware of, with M Division boss Marcus Flash describing the big coupe as a Porsche turbo killer. Big talk then, so how does it compare? Well, while it can't quite match the numbers of the 911 Turbo, the current Carrera 4S seems to be roughly on par with the big BMW. 0-62 is taken care of in 3.4 seconds, while top speed is up slightly at 190 miles per hour. Both cars are all-wheel drive, but at around the two-ton mark, the BMW is significantly heavier. To address this, the M division has been busy with the chassis. The X-Drive system has been set up to feel distinctly rear-balanced, helping to induce that signature M car oversteer while allowing enough traction to put all of that power from the 4.4-litre turbocharged V8 onto the tarmac. However, steering and suspension changes seem rather minor. It's basically the same setup as on the lesser M850i, but with some small yet significant tweaks like increased negative camber at the front and changes to the damping. Six piston drill discs are fitted as standard, although most customers will likely opt for the optional massive carbon ceramics. New for the M8 are the adjustable brake modes. The brakes can be switched between comfort and sport, allowing for different pedal pressures to slow the car. At first glance, the M8 doesn't look much different from a regular 8 series, but look a little closer and you'll spot clues to the monstrous performance. 
There are bigger air intakes in the front bumper, while the grille, wing mirrors and rear diffuser are now painted black. A subtle rear spoiler sits atop the boot lid, while four gaping exhaust tips poke out of the back. It also gains a set of lightweight 20 inch forged alloys, while inside the changes are similarly restrained. The seats look a bit sportier and are a bit more body hugging, while carbon fibre trim is sprinkled around the cabin. Our favourite tweak though is the pair of bright red M buttons on the steering wheel, tempting you to unleash the car's full potential. Apart from those minor changes though, the M8's interior is still a very nice place to be. There's leather everywhere and all the luxuries from the regular 8 series. What we have here then is two cars in one. A luxurious, comfortable, long distance GT car, perfect for a long weekend away. It has a big boot and four seats and you can even get it with a soft top. On the other hand, you have a wild, howling 616 horsepower track weapon, capable of keeping up with some serious competition. So, while it may well be one of M Division's priciest products, it could well be one of its best. As is the case with a lot of 4x4s these days, the once humble Jeep Wrangler has become something of a fashion statement. Its blocky looks and utilitarian appeal may be in vogue right now, but underneath it is still first and foremost an off-road vehicle. It uses a traditional ladder frame chassis with the body bolted on top, the windscreen still folds flat, and if you feel so inclined, you can take the doors off to get a better view of the obstacles you're driving over. The Wrangler is available as either a two-door or a four-door, but even the long wheelbase car has a little in the way of practicality. The cabin is cramped and the boot is smaller than in most super minis. Performance is nothing to write home about, or at least it wasn't until now. For as long as the Wrangler has been on sale, buyers have been pestering Jeep to build one with a V8. And now, finally, here it is. This is the new Rubicon 392, the fastest Wrangler ever made. Under the bonnet sits a 6.4 litre motor or 392 cubic inches, hence the name. That enormous engine is a Hemi V8, one of America's most iconic power plants. And with 450 horsepower on tap, it'll get the Wrangler from 0 to 60 in just four and a half seconds. That's fast by any standards. In fact, it's Mercedes G63 territory. Jeep even says the 392 will do the quarter mile in just 13 seconds. So aside from the massive engine, what has Jeep changed? Well, first off, there's no manual gearbox option for the V8, with an 8-speed auto box being the sole option. There's a rather naughty exhaust at the back to really make the most of that V8 soundtrack, and the suspension and axles have been upgraded to handle the extra grunt. But don't think that all this extra poke means the 392 is shying away from its off-roading routes. Far from it. In fact, it's even more trail-ready than the standard car. The ride height has been increased by 51 millimetres and there's a special air induction system to improve its wading capabilities. There are also some massive knobbly tyres as standard, as well as the Wrangler's usual array of off-road driving modes. Naturally, there's been a few tweaks to the styling too, with a big scoop on the bonnet and some nice bronze and aluminium trim details dotted around the interior. So you might be asking, why has it taken Jeep so long to build this car? After all, as a sister company to Chrysler and Dodge, there's always been plenty of V8 engine options to choose from. Well, the answer comes from Ford. When the new Bronco was unveiled last year, complete with eight cylinders under the bonnet, it seems Jeep realised that the Wrangler might finally have some convertible 4x4 competition. 
Ford's order books have been filling up for the new Bronco and it's hardly surprising. Its retro styling oozes cool while its off-road credentials are right up there with the Jeeps. It gets a host of factory off-road extras, like the superb brush wires and those mammoth 35-inch knobbly tyres. Underbody protection is available, as well as heavy-duty steel bumpers and LED light bars. Like the Wrangler, you could also remove various bits of bodywork if you live somewhere sunny enough to do so. Time will tell which of these V8 off-roaders will prove to be more popular. But with its heritage, loyal fan base and its Hemi, we'd say the Jeep has every chance. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we check out Porsche's new EV estate car, the Taycan Cross Turismo.